podcast three. This podcast looks at the at the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia on the um, outcome of the war. There's the mind map. So so far we have looked at the fall of Bethmann Holbeck, and we have seen how the military high command uh, is increasingly out of touch, having re- having blatantly ignored the peace resolution. Um, that the Reichstag put forward in July 1917. Um, the military dictatorship obviously now pinning all their hopes on ending the war in the east so that Germany can turn her forces westwards to end the war against France and Britain before America can get into the war. Um, the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution then is what we're going to look at in this third podcast. So again, make sure you re- you look at William Carr, pages two hundred and twenty nine to thirty. All the page references are on these slides, so you can um, follow through afterwards. So let's take it point by point. In November nineteen seventeen, um, the Bolsheviks, as we know, seized power. They overthrew the provisional government. The provisional government, remember, um, under Kerensky, had continued the war against Germany. Um, Lenin and the Bolsheviks seized power in November 1917 and immediately made the decision that they wanted to end the war with Germany. And that, that obviously um, was um, a, a great uh, victory for the German Supreme Command. Um, however, initially, um, the Bolsheviks pushed for a peace treaty um, based on compromise um, rather than um, having to surrender huge amounts of territory. Now, as we know, the German Supreme Command were not interested in a peace treaty based on compromise. Um, so, after a few weeks of um, delaying tactics, effectively, um, Hindenburg and Ludendorff relaunched an attack on Russia in February 1918. Now, the Russians were in no position to resist. They were war-weary, um, they could not continue the war against Germany, and so the Germans, um, when they relaunched that attack, they moved um, very, very swiftly further eastwards. Um, and so Lenin and Trotsky um, basically had to accept the war now needed to end on German terms. So the famous Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed in March 1918, and of course that was a complete victory for Hindenburg and Ludendorff. By the terms of the Treaty of brest vast expanses of territory in the east were taken from Russia and annexed by Germany. Now, go back to Berlin, look at the German Reichstag, which as we know the largest party in the Reichstag was the SPD, 110 seats in the elections of 1912. The SPD had always, um, one, um, advocated an end to the war, well, they've got that. But secondly, the SPD had always advocated an end to the war based on compromise, not based on annexation. So, in effect, in a sense, this is the wrong type of peace. So, a bit of a dilemma for the SPD. How did they feel about the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk? Well, effectively, the leadership of the SPD, which was the older generation, um, led by Aber acknowledged the fact that although it was the wrong type of peace, nevertheless it was a peace. So therefore, in the Reichstag, the SPD voted to support the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. There's a map um, that shows, remember, the uh, fronts as they were at the beginning of the war. This map here, um, looking at the east, um, if I just mark that, is the... The, the, the front line in December 1917 um, when uh, Lenin sued for peace um, remember the protracted um, delay in tactics and then the Germans um, uh, uh, launched an attack in February 1918 um, and that's their advance so by March 1918 when Lenin and Trotsky um, finally signed the Treaty of brest um, the Germans had taken all of that territory, and that's the territory that was taken from Russia by the terms of the Treaty of brest Now, let's go back 
to the political left. Let's think first of all in terms of the political left inside the Reichstag. Now, remember, 110 deputies in the Reichstag that try to unlock yourself from the, 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 the way in which it's easy to think all 110 deputies had the same viewpoint. They didn't. The majority of the SPD deputies were increasingly out of touch with the mood amongst the ordinary German people. Now, the ordinary German people, so you know, think in terms of the picture here, on the streets, um, were increasingly moving towards the extreme left. Ordinary German workers actually viewed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk as evidence that the upper classes, the ruling elites of Germany, were greedy. Um, so although it was on one level a great victory for Germany with huge amounts of territory seized in the east, um, for ordinary German workers back in Germany all the old problems are continuing. Um, massive food shortages, remember Spanish flu is hitting Germany at this stage, they're war weary. Um, the, the idea has very much taken root that the upper classes are running the war purely for their own effort. And so when the Treaty of brest was signed in March 1918, it was not greeted uh, as a great victory. It was, it was actually um, viewed by many workers as evidence that the rulers of Germany were purely greedy. Um, so look at the, uh, what happened. January 1918, there was a massive strike of nearly half a million workers in Berlin. Um, Treaty of Brest Litovsk didn't make any difference to that mood. So, interestingly, if you look at the, the, the demands of those strikers, they were not just economic. Um, increasingly now, the workers are becoming politicised. They're starting to make political demands. So those strikers um, were also demanding constitutional change. They're starting to say that the Chancellor... Um, and the state secretaries, the government, should be accountable now to the Reichstag, not to the Kaiser. Um, and they do not want a peace based on annexation, a peace based on Siegfried, that they want a peace based on compromise. So um, the, the mood of the workers outside the Reichstag are, is becoming increasingly left-wing and much more political. They're demanding um, constitutional change. So what we actually have, if we go inside the Reichstag and we look at the members of the Reichstag, we've actually got a split. On one level, we've got a minority of the members of the Reichstag um, who are increasingly critical of the majority of the SPD leaders. Um, these, these minority, and initially there were 42 of them, are actually saying the war is being waged by greedy elites. Um, it is an imperialistic war, purely in the interests of the upper classes. Now, there were 42 of those members who felt, that, who, who felt that way. In fact, the majority of the SPD were sympathetic to that viewpoint. But the majority were reluctant to speak out against the Kaiser. Um, so there was a division, in a sense... Although there was, on the whole, there was unity over the view that the war was an imperialistic war, um, the older generation of the uh, the older members of the SPD were um, still very loyal to the Kaiser. But there's a minority of the SPD who are increasingly speaking out against the Kaiser um, and felt very strongly, and very much a sort of younger younger element of the SPD. So effectively, we see now a, 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 a tangible division in the SPD that resulted in April 1917, the SPD splitting into two parties. So the minority, the younger members, those that were much more left-wing, um, broke away and became the USPD, the Independent Socialist Party. The remainder... Um, uh, continued to be the SPD, although the historians will often call them the majority SPD, and they were the MSPD, and they were led by Hebert. Um, so as we move into 1917-18, to 18, through the turnip winter, um, we increasingly see the USPD gaining more and more support on the streets. Okay, so um, as we move into the, the, the January strike, the January 1918 Berlin strike, the independents are becoming much more of a mass party. Um, 
as the work has become radicalised, they're starting to turn more and more to the USPD. There were also um, other left-wing groups that were not represented in the Reichstag, so we have to be mindful of that. Um, the, the, the least significant were the Spartacus League, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. Um, they very much um, admired Lenin and the Bolsheviks. They wanted to adopt revolutionary tactics following the, the blueprint of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Uh, much more influential, not in the Reichstag, but on the streets, and in particular in the factories, were the revolutionary shop stewards. They were the main organisers behind the January um, strike in Berlin. Very, very influential group, the revolutionary shop stewards. Um, and interestingly, as an afterward, the January 1918 Berlin strike um, was repressed by the military. Ludendorff and Hindenburg basically sent the troops into the factories, and that's the first occasion we hear the right-wing elites uh, use the phrase stab in the back. They claimed that the strikers were stabbing Germany in the back. Now, that's obviously a phrase that was much more co uh, common um, later on in 1918, but it was actually used in January 1918. OK, so that's the end of this third podcast. If you can now go on to the final podcast, which is about the military collapse um, and the October reform. Thank you.